that. I'll turn this. No, stop. Yeah, put it on Alex. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to make it tenor. Oh, God. Don't tenor. look at the screen either because <laughs> then we're going to be looking off in the distance. Hi, everyone. We are live. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, we'll do intros in a second. Um, but first, I wanted to kick off with some really exciting slash boring stuff. But it's necessary because... Um, actually, we've gotten a lot of questions about if we work um, and <laughs> or do we just train. We actually do work. We work a lot. I work primarily just on this YouTube channel and keeping the content going and making sure we have videos every week and making sure, um, you know, we, uh, we have fun doing it still. <laughs> um, but to do that, we need partners, we need sponsors, we need people to actually help support us and support the channel so we can keep creating content. Um, so I wanted to just throw out some partners that we offer through our channel. And the reason why I'm doing this is this, like if you are in the market for any of these brands or products, um, please, please, please click the unique links that we offer, use the codes because if you do that, it shows these partners that we have invested followers and people that actually enjoy our content. Um, we're not forcing you to go click these links, but like just if you are interested in this stuff, um, please use our links because it's very helpful for us um, to keep the content going. So I just wanted to name them. Um, one of our newer sponsors, one of our newer partners is Sailfish. They make the best wetsuits out there. Um, Jenna and I recently just got the Sailfish wetsuits and swim skins, and they are unlike anything we've ever worn. We used to wear Rokas and these are exponentially better. Um, so again, if you're interested in the wetsuit, check these guys out. They're awesome. Um, Finice is another swimwear brand. Uh, they just make the best swim gear to make you become a better swimmer um, from snorkels to fins to paddles, all that stuff. Um, so if you're if you're in the market for swim gear, check, check out Finice, F-I-N-I-S. Everyone has a different pronunciation of Finis. Um, Hungry Root, they are a grocery delivery service. They're the best. Check them out. Um, Via, they are a hemp company. They make products uh, with and without THC, um, but the stuff without THC is perfect for athletic recovery. Um, Tread Labs, that is a, uh, you know, a footwear insole company. You can put these insoles in your running and cycling shoes um we've been wearing them for a while they're great the carbon ones are perfect for cycling highly recommend um whoop and these are these are a few others whoop you probably know what they are they're just like you know um biometric tracking mm -hmm. uh momentous they are a supplement and like um nutrition companies so like protein and Omega three, like all the stuff we need, um, basic stuff we need as athletes. Um, and then eight sleep, they are, uh, a company that makes, uh, sleeping products and that's why we sleep so well. Um, but actually really cool. They're like, you know, innovative mattress companies are starting to pop up, but they kind of are paving the way on that front. So, um, and Toyota. <laughs> yeah, our newest sponsor, Toyota. <laughs> but just a specific dealership <laughs> in where we live. Um, so. And every brand that we talk about, we like, like objectively love. We would not talk about something that we don't genuinely use and like approve of. And we would never like try to sell something that we did not like actually use in our day to day lives. So. Yeah, just click our links if you're interested in anything. Um, a question just came in about watches, shoes, socks, and glasses. We don't have sponsor for, sponsors for those things, but when we do, we'll let you know. Or if you know anyone. Or if you know anyone, <laughs> let is, us know. This is how we get our sponsorships is like from supporters mainly mm -hmm. and like people who watch our content and, you know, connect us with people um, that can help us out. So, you know, we lean on you guys for a lot of this stuff. So um, you know, our ask in return is if you're interested in any of this stuff is to please use our, our codes and links. Um, but so, you know, me, you know, Miguel, and today we have our special guest, Alex Leandri here with us. She's a new working triathlete coach. She's been on our team working triathlete for, um, since the inception of yeah, working triathlete, probably. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah, we just wanted to, I mean, we're all here down in Chattanooga, Tennessee for Ironman 70.3 Chattanooga tomorrow morning. Um, so we wanted to hop on here with Alex and answer some questions that you all sent in. And if you have any um, like questions right now as you're watching, drop them in in the, the live chat. I have it up right now so we can see them live hopping in or if you have any comments or anything. Um, yeah. We'll yeah, just... we, we plan to talk about some serious things like triathlon, um, but also non-serious like burritos and oatmeal. So like literally anything. <laughs> Those are very serious. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> other way around, <laughs> I should say. <laughs> Um, but, uh, intros really quick. I think we got some questions about how we all like, like got into triathlon, like a little backstory on ourselves. I'd love for Alex to just introduce her. Yeah. Well, we should, we should start with Alex. So I'm Alex. Uh, like Jenna said, I am one of the newer triathlon coaches with working try. I've been on the team for a few years. Um, my coach is also Conrad, which is uh, who also coaches Jenna Miguel that everybody knows and loves. Um, <laughs> How many coaches do we have now? We have five coaches. Yeah. There's we had like one a I year know. ago. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. It's Our crazy. team is growing. Um, and so, yeah, so we're in Chattanooga right now. We're going to race tomorrow. Um, and I was on my little bike, little just spin ride this morning and I just saw like our kits around and I saw somebody in our WT socks and then it's just so cool. Like I don't even, I haven't met anybody yet. And um everybody's just here and our team is just growing so much. So it's pretty cool. But yeah, so I'm Alex. I live in Nashville right now. Um, and I, I have a little puppy who's um, a menace. I love him so much. This is an important <laughs> detail to Alex. It and, is. Yes. So. Um, my four legged friend, I call him my, my Walter. Um, <laughs> Walter. <laughs> he's a nut. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm an engineer by day and I work in triathlete coach um, by morning and night. Um, yeah, that is the definition of a working <laughs> triathlon. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> um, that's pretty fun. Yeah. And how, how did you get into the sport? So I got into the sport. So I grew up swimming and running. Uh, my mom tried to put me in basketball and soccer and I kicked a goal in the other, um, <laughs> in the other net, in the other net. Um, it didn't go well. So she was like, let's try swimming. Um, I actually got DQ'd in my very first race ever. It was a 25 butterfly. <laughs> But thankfully, I stuck out with that one. Um, and I started running. And after college, I kind of went, let's just add a bike to it and start a new sport. So that's kind of how I got into triathlon. Um, and then now we're here. And uh, one of the questions that we got was about um, certifications or requirements to become a coach. Yeah. And you recently just went through all of that. I did, yes. Um, so I am certified like through um, USA Triathlon. I'm a level one triathlon coach. And so you go through like a whole program. They did a fantastic job. Um, you know, they teach you how to make a plan, different types of athletes, different um, levels of racing and different lengths that you can go through. So you can like specify you want to coach long distance versus short course. Um, so sprint and Olympics versus like your half Ironman, full Ironman and um USAT, there was a couple courses that I had to complete to become certified, um, but I did it through USAT. You can get certified through Ironman, um, probably a couple more, but USAT did a great job. So that's how I'm certified. And I also obviously am a coach for Working Try. And you have spots on your roster? I do, yes. If anybody is looking for uh, a coaching, I'm open for it and I would love to coach you. I can do just running, just biking, just swimming. Or all three, and we'll have some fun with training and racing. And working triathlete, too, I think, owes a little bit of an explanation here. But, it, it, like, to, to become part of the team and community, you don't have to sign up for coaching. Um, there are different tiers depending on what your budget is for the sport. We know the sport can get crazy expensive. Personally, like, if I look at what investments to make as, like, you're going down the path of triathlon, a coach – or at least a really good training plan or just support and community, all of that stuff comes like before gear and like upgrading gear. Mm -hmm. um, because once you're a part of those communities and like you have a coach or a training plan or just like getting connected with people, like you start to learn so much about what's next. And it just like accelerates the growth in the sport as opposed to investing a thousand dollars on 
a disc wheel. <laughs> you got your disc wheel, but you learned nothing from it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you, yeah, you have a power meter, but you don't know what it's telling you or how to trade with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. But check us out. Um, working triathlete.com because, uh, there's an option out there for everybody. And we like, you know, we want our team to grow too. Mm -hmm. We have like 50 people racing yeah. at this it's biggest wild. show yeah. turnout we've ever had. It's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jenna, how did you get into the sport? You can be quick. Yeah, I talked about it at length in our last live from August of last year. But basically, at the beginning of college, I did a race with my older brother, and it went horribly. Neither of us trained. And after college, I was kind of looking for another um, like competitive outlet. And I was like lifting a bunch and like setting, I don't know, like squat PRs, but it wasn't really like itching that like, what was your like, squat pr <laughs> what was your squat? someone's <laughs> going to ask that so right. well, it was like uh, one, <laughs> yeah. 180 i think nice. all right okay. yeah i don't know what it's, that means anymore <laughs> well i weighed like 135 at the time 140 ish at the time and 180 was my pr That's anyway right. besides yeah. the Sorry. point so squat and go with the backpack on exactly yeah. <laughs> it's huge i can squat like four walters <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. Um, we measure everything in dogs. Yeah. <laughs> but no, so, so yeah, I was just, I don't know, wanting to kind of get back into swimming. I swam in college. I should have left off with that. Um, and yeah, just wanted to do something that was athletic again, athletic in like a competitive sense with like other people around, find a community to like train with and at the time was living in Brooklyn, hooked up with the Brooklyn Tri Club and found my little community of triathletes there. And yeah, I just started, started going and went to the like local Brooklyn pool and met Miguel there. So I found love through. That's where our story became one. <laughs> Good where, segue. That's where I am a single person. Yeah. Um, similar story minus the death in Hawaii as the first race, but I was also a swimmer growing up. Um, I, uh, you know, was a, on a competitive swim team since like four years old. Like I did the, I don't know, whatever that would be called. It's not swimming when you're four, it's more like a survival. survival. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, and then I went on to make that my only sport through high school and then into college. I went to Fordham University, um, had a had a decently successful career there, ended on like the highest note I possibly could have. Um, and then I and then it ended. Like I had the best race of my life as the last race of my life in college. And I was like, that was so much fun. I can't just like stop doing things now, you know? Um, I think as college athletes or any athlete growing up, you kind of like you lose part of your identity when you're not doing your sport anymore. It's like, now what? Um, but I, you know, I did my professional stuff. I graduated, got a job in marketing at a healthcare technology company and uh, had a coworker at the time who is Conrad's cousin, um, which was very fortunate. And he, he was, he came back from a, you know, like a Christmas break, holiday break. And uh, he was like, Hey, do you want to do an Ironman with me? And I'm like, sure. He's <laughs> like, my cousin's a coach. He's going to coach us. And a week later, he was no longer doing the sport. He was like, this is too much for me. <laughs> He's like, I just want to play basketball. Shout out, Jake. Thank you for getting me into the sport. He just wanted to play basketball. Um, but I continued on the sport and lost, severely lost interest in doing an Ironman. Um, but, you know, caught the bug and just kept doing the sport. So I'm sure similar stories are out there where it's like you're kind of you, you are athletic or you want to be you you aspire to be something and you kind of like you're searching for something and then you try out some aspect of triathlon for me it was just like having the coach and doing a little training um but then you just like you just keep going and yeah you know, mm -hmm. it's a fun journey yeah um we've we've gotten several questions about whether like people should get a coach or whether an online training plan is like a better direction to go. Um, I mean, we can 
talk about that at yeah. depth. I can say that when I started out doing triathlon, I didn't have a coach and I was just doing kind of whatever I wanted to do mm-hmm. and swimming, biking, running at regular intervals, but without like any purpose to my training. And I saw the most improvements in the year after I started getting coached by a coach. Yep. Like once Conrad came on board, I was, I mean, now, now my trans and my triathlon career is like completely different than it was yeah. two years ago. So definitely. Well, how does it differ? This is another question, but how does it differ versus a training plan? I think just having a coach, you're able to have a relationship with that person and not only plan your training around your life, but kind of you're able to have someone who can do that 30,000 foot view of what you need to do and what you need to work on. And okay, let's only focus on running for a week or let's only focus on biking or, you know, your transitions suck. <clears throat> Miguel. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. And you just, it's just a whole I'm different listening. level. <laughs> So, I mean, like myself, I also trained for a few years without uh, having a coach and just kind of doing it on a whim and guessing. Um, And you only get so far with that. So I think that having a coach just kind of amplifies that. It also opens you up to having like a team and your sense of community, um, which is huge. I mean, our team's growing exponentially by the day. So it's cool. I think you um, agree with, I agree with all of that. It's super important, like especially just having someone who has the holistic view over what you're doing, um, because we want to just, we want to wake up and do our training. And if you're confident that what you're doing is exactly right for you, you can do things way better and way more easily. You don't want to have doubt when you're like doing a hard bike ride, like, is this actually right for me? Mm -hmm. And the stuff that you pull off the internet is not right for you. It wasn't made. For it wasn't you. made for you. It just mm-hmm. it wasn't. Um, you know, it gets the job done if you know if that's where you're at right now and that's what you can afford. Like, find a good training plan. That's huge. That's the first step. But you know, a coach get, goes a step beyond that. I think it's also like having someone in your corner is huge. Like, I think of myself in this sport as you know, like you're in your corner of the boxing ring and you have all your people behind you, and each person <laughs> has a different. Um, purpose in Conrad's your triathlon like career. This. Conrad's <laughs> giving me a, a massage. I've got yeah. a towel. <laughs> yeah. But I'm literally, yelling. that's what I envision. It's like it, it, these people, like some people, you know, you, you these aren't even the people that like you're paying to help you in the sport of triathlon. Like one of them is like your mom and your dad, your brother, your sister, you know, like everyone is serving a different purpose for you in the sport. So like a coach is going to be the person right there, like whispering in your ear, giving you a back rub. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like race specific too though as well like I know I would skip workouts when it was just me just because I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do for the day and I was like yeah I guess I can go swim for 30 minutes or do a quick jog but it's if it's not specified you lose that aspect of it and so when you have a coach and you have a training plan you wake up and it's already there for you and you know that I have a purposeful you know, track workout or have a purposeful big day on the bike or a purposeful, easy swim, they all piece it together in gearing up for whatever race you have on the calendar, whether that's just to be healthy, whether it's to, you know, win USAT nationals or just beat your brother in a race, you know, anything. It just, you wake up and it's just there. You don't have to think about it. And then that's one excuse that you don't have anymore. I think the, um, well, this is, we've gotten a lot of questions about like work-life balance too. Um, and this is a good segue into that because your coach starts to, that that's a huge responsibility for Conrad in our lives. Yeah. And Alex, for your athletes, that's what, you know, partially what you're managing too. Yeah, like, yeah. they, talk about they have that. to have specific off days. Like, you know, we all have to have specific off days or something happens with family and you say, hey, I immediately have to travel out of state. I'm not going to have a bike your coach can completely pivot your whole workout to say, okay, well, let's figure it out. Let's not do any biking. Um, you're only going to run for the next couple of days or take it easy. If you have, if you're sick, like I'm sure Conrad adjusted your plan when you got sick. Yes. <laughs> Keep <laughs> going. <nothing. laughs> I mean, I was like, listen, I'm not doing anything yeah. for the next yeah. several days. But yeah. that there's something to be said for being able to do on the fly, change things up. I had an athlete yesterday go, Hey, things got crazy at work. 
not going to get my run in. I said, okay, we'll do it tomorrow. We'll switch things around. And then so it's so much easier. And they make you feel good about yes. that as well. Like yeah. Conrad or our coach is never like, oh, like how dare you have to skip this workout because work <laughs> is running late or like right. your, your dog needs you right. or your kids need you. Um, and yeah, they just like reassure you that everything will be okay. You're still mm -hmm. putting in the work and yeah. it's like switching around a couple workouts isn't going to like, like make or break anything. And I, yeah. And I think to Miguel's original point where like, if you have a busy schedule, having a coach able, like enables you to have very intense workouts in the short time frame in the mornings or at night, if that's all you can do, or if you can only work out for an hour at lunch, we can plan that out mm -hmm. and do whatever you need to do for that. Yeah. And I think the important thing that you said too, is like the mindset component that like if you miss a workout or you need to move things around, like knowing that that's not going to be the end of the world, like having a coach that understands your priorities is going to help your work life balance because it's, they will encourage you to like, Hey, prioritize your family. Like mm -hmm. they need you. Yeah. Triathlon will come second. A lot of people just want to train, train, train. And it's like, well, if you're traveling like four days a week for work and you have a family, like this is how many hours you're going to do. And these are the days you're going to do it, whether you like it or not. <laughs> like, yeah. and that's important to like, cause yeah. I think for the majority of us in the sport, like we don't have a problem training. Sometimes we do. Everybody has a hard day, like motivating themselves to train, but like for the most part, we, we could just keep going. We could wake up and keep going and we need people to like help us prioritize and balance these things. Um, and then to make us feel good about that balance too, mm -hmm. it's healthy. Mm -hmm. um, does that cover work-life balance? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, as, as like part of that too, we got a lot of questions that were like, how do we balance a nine to five job? Um, with training there were there was i think a little confusion about, first of all do we have yeah <laughs> about whether a nine to five job yes. exists yes my eight to seven job exists yes. um <laughs> i i work full time um miguel has a more relaxed or lenient schedule but he sets his own schedule with his work um and you work i'm sure eight to seven as well yeah. <laughs> yeah, she has two jobs and yeah. is training yeah um, but I mean, to, to manage the working and the training, like you have to plan out your weeks ahead of time. I like Miguel and I think about what meals we're going to make at the beginning of the week. And we also think about like how we're going to fit in our training throughout the week. And mm -hmm. if it's writing down or like putting like time blocks on our Google calendars that also has our work calendars on it, it really like keeps you accountable to like doing your swims in the morning and like taking your hour at lunch to like do a quick run before coming back. Mm -hmm. um, we're, I mean, we all work from home now, which makes it much easier for us. Um, like not having commutes anymore is yeah. really great, but yeah, in order to stick to a training schedule regularly, it's really like, it's necessary to write it down somewhere and to like, have like that meeting blocked off. Yeah, yeah we're definitely in the, in the era of more work flexibility, it doesn't apply to everyone, but I think for the most part, a lot of people have shifted to work from home. I am doing this content creation and YouTube full time. So obviously there's a lot of flexibility in that. Um, but yeah, I think like just developing your own ritual and I call it a ritual rather than a routine because a ritual is you know, something you kind of like live and breathe, you know, mm -hmm. um, but just finding your ritual and sticking to it. And, uh, and yeah, every day you got to hold yourself accountable for mm -hmm. it. There was someone who, uh, who said accountability was kind of the biggest help with all of this. And I think that's very true. Like you can find that on your triathlon team, your coach, your, and like, especially your coworkers, I think they're, um, there's a lot of help to be found within the community at work that like understand what you're going through. I think it's all like transparency is always important. Like letting your manager know that you train a lot for this stuff and letting them know how important it is to you and your life, like is always a good idea. Um, because people, you know, hopefully if they're good people, they will help you get through this stuff. Yeah. Um, for sure.
Do we want to go to some Instagram questions? Can we talk about a perfect burrito? Yes. <laughs> We've been too serious. Right. Can yes. we can we settle the score on how many burritos you have officially eaten in these last three weeks, six weeks? I mean, I think my last post said 47, <laughs> but that was a jump from like 16. So um, I don't know, a lot. And for some reason, uh, you know, we live in California. I feel like very biased or like we have the best burritos and Mexican food over there. But for some reason, like if I'm getting to Tennessee, everybody's like, you've got to try this burrito. We haven't um, had any Southern yeah. food. <laughs> No hot chicken. We will be having hot <laughs> we, chicken. We will next have hot week. chicken. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of burritos. A lot. I've I've tried a lot of the Nashville spots for burritos. Um, you know, some in a car, some not in a car. But yeah, I we were talking a little bit about the perfect burrito. Well, you tell me what makes a perfect burrito. Okay, I think well, it's all subjective, open to debate. But there are two big components to a perfect burrito. There is the preparation and like you know the construction of the burrito and then there's the actual like ingredients and taste okay and you can go you can break those down i think the construction is a little uh, a, a little more black and white because like the just, wrap of yeah it. you just you, need you to need make sure job. Like, well it can't be falling okay apart we can go because that's we can keep going down. that's number one <laughs> but like have you ever taken a bite into a burrito and it's like, wow, this is all lettuce. Yeah, and yeah. then the bottom is like, there's the meat. Yeah, you, know? Yeah. Or you have to take like two bites to get like everything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's built like this. Yeah. So I've found that <laughs> if you're constructing a burrito, you, you want to melt the cheese on the tortilla because that way, no matter where you're taking your bite, you're so getting an equal amount of cheese. Do you automatically go burrito equals cheese? I think cheese should be in a burrito. I don't, yes. I'm trying to think of what burritos I would ever eat that wouldn't have cheese on them. I can't. If you're vegan, maybe. True. If yes, very you true. have problems with dairy. That's very I good. It. Yes. Personally. Yeah. I, I've um, had burritos without cheese, but I think like if we're talking about the perfect burrito here, like close cheese. your eyes, bite in a burrito. <laughs> it has cheese. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so the construction, I think like those two elements is like, will it drip? you know, at the end of Good your burrito, question. like, yeah. you know, you, you need it to be clean. I think that's the point of a burrito. I keep doing this with my hands, no matter what we're talking about, but it's a burrito. It's clean. This is his optimal yep. size of a burrito <laughs> as well. The size, yeah. too. The size. The size is definitely important. I You don't want to be skimped on a burrito. No. And you want it to be full, yes. you know, like less air in your burrito, the better. Yeah. You shouldn't be able to squish it anymore <clears> than it's already squished. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. And then like where the stuff is in your burrito. Um, I'm not saying you have to like mix everything together and then put it in your burrito. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, you don't want like a smoothie burrito, <laughs> <laughs> but there should be an equal distribution of ingredients, no matter where you're taking it. And I think the cheese melted on the, on the outside of the tortilla is like that, that ensures cheese in every bite. Yeah. Which it is does. very important. Um, Locks it all in. And then like for the taste, I mean, we could talk about breakfast burritos, you know, <laughs> what types of meat you want on your burrito. I think for me, I like to keep it simple with like, a, I, I mean, I'll put, I'll put uh, breakfast burritos aside for now, but like a good marinated seasoned chicken that just kind of like Ooh, melts in your mouth, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. then you can go the pork and beef options. That's fine. But like a good chicken burrito, that's just like well seasoned and marinated and cooked and that's perfect. I like beans in my burrito. Um, I like a little bit of rice in my burrito. Um, guac. Do you pay more for guac? I'll put more for guac. I used to like cream cheese in my burrito, but um, then then you're on the what? you're on the timer. You know, like cream cheese or sour cream? sour cream. Oh. I'm so sorry. <laughs> like what? Is that? Yeah, that's something I don't know about. <laughs> yeah, you got your. Uh, <laughs> Got your locks and your sour cream in your burrito. Um, Justin Myers, I think this is your question that we are answering. So I'm really glad that you are here right now. I'm here for the burrito. Yeah, we all are. Uh, <laughs> what so a, sour cream, yeah, for sure. Yeah, sorry, sour cream. Yeah. But if you put sour cream, then you got to eat it right away or else it just it destroys everything. Yeah. So are you a saute the vegetables before burrito or like total crunch? I like fresh vegetables. Yeah. 
Um, I'd sometimes like a fajita burrito. Uh, but if, if we're talking non fajita burrito, I, I, you know, fresh veggies. Well, what types of fresh veggies? I think a little lettuce. Oh, a little lettuce, a little pico. I like two types of salsa in my burrito. I like the fresh pico de gallo and I like some spice and kick. And then I always have a, a hand for hot sauce. <laughs> so, <laughs> Which is why the wrap job needs, needs to be good. Because right? you only have one hand. Yeah. The other hand's for hot sauce. <laughs> How about, okay, would you guys agree? I think we, we should, should move on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting real hungry. <laughs> oh, God. All right, next question. <laughs> um, yeah, should we, we can do a little bit of rapid fire. Yeah, here let's do want. some rapid fire. All right, which is better, a handful of gummy bears or a... Uh, Mar- Martins. Martins. I'd say gummy bears just because those Martins kind of freak me out. Yeah, I'm not a fan. I go gummy bears as well. Personally, when I'm riding, if I'm eating something, it's like it takes away a little bit of um, reminding myself that I'm still on my bike. Mm-hmm. So it's like, oh, okay, here's a little meal. I'll go oh, burritos. <laughs> Wild card. Um, uh, we're talking about descending on a bike. Is it? Is it slower, more difficult on a time trial bike compared to a road bike? Um, it, it's faster on a TT faster, bike. Yeah, as sure. uh, Okay, it depends what type of descent it is. Like if it's a really technical descent with a lot of turns or is really steep. Like if you're on a TT bike, you better not be in your, in your aero bars. Like mm-hmm. get on your horns and like use your brakes. If it's straight, absolutely. Like... TT bike is much faster. Yeah. And just, you know, be comfortable riding flat before you start descending fast on a TT bike. Yeah. Um, otherwise, it is slower and it is more difficult because road bikes are made for this, like, technical stuff. Okay. Um, and then, uh, oh, question about working triathlete camp, um, yes. which was our last video. Alex, do you want to talk about camp and like what it next year, maybe? Yes, working triathlon camp. So this is um, year two of our camp. We had so much fun. We were up in Montgomery Bell Park, Tennessee, and they obviously did a great job showing their video of it. Um, Camp is open to anybody that wants to sign up. We do have like a a limit. We want to keep it to a certain number. However, as we grow, we understand that the camp needs to go bigger as well. You do not need to be part of the working triathlon community. Um, to come to camp, but then if you do come to camp, you do become a working triathlete um, communist (laughs) (laughs) community member (laughs) by proxy. (laughs) Yeah, silly but important point. If you show up, but if you you do become part of our our team. Uh, and it was a ton of fun. I highly recommend anybody who has never been to a triathlon camp. I would never been to a triathlon camp before, yeah, and I had an amazing time yeah. all weekend. So we, we have some wonderful speakers that come, and it's it's not just swim, biking, and running. We obviously have a great time with that. So if you ever are just you know bored of riding with friend or no one and swimming by yourself, mm-hmm. um, it's a great place to meet new people that all share very fun, expensive hobbies. There were there were a lot of people that went this year that were not working triathlete members yeah. um and they had a ton of fun it was yeah. like you everyone was just one family by the end of this thing um uh what is miguel's training plan for putting on his shoes uh considering your horrible transition times um yeah so if anyone watched our uh multi-sport uh nationals videos um you saw how bad my transitions were also shout out these two for just, being fast yeah for being fast <laughs> <Transition>. <laughs> just like <laughs> being the reinforcements that we needed that weekend um yeah. and bringing home the gold that was fun yeah. if you didn't recognize alex i don't know if you mentioned that oh, in I your didn't. intro no. but you are a national champion we are all national yes, champions i got to anchor and i got to break the tape which has never happened in my life but hopefully it won't be the last time. So I'm going to watch yeah. that video again tonight. So <laughs> specifically the transition. Yeah. <laughs> no, fortunately, tomorrow is a very long race. Um, so I don't have to think about that too much. So that's my training plan. <laughs> <Just to ignore. laughs> is to know it's not important. <laughs> but also he has them with him here. <laughs> I do. So I do. He, I've been joking that he just puts them on and off every time he does anything. 
but the truth is I haven't put them on <laughs> since Grace Day. <laughs> since Grace Day. Uh, but I got a lot of practice in um, over that weekend. So I'm confident. I'm confident. Uh, you can only do one for the rest of your life, running, biking, or swimming. Uh, well, the I, question was running yeah, or biking. Run, okay, yeah. well, we'll add swimming okay. to it. We can add swimming. I think if I could only do one thing, does swimming in the ocean on vacation count as swimming? I think so. Yes. That's exactly yes. what I was then thinking. Then 100% swimming. Yeah. 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 I would give up so, running and biking. Well, okay. Like wading in a pool doesn't count as swimming. Like you can go in a pool and wade. I don't need to wade in a pool, but like <laughs> swimming in the ocean. Like, swimming in the ocean. Yeah. 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 Swimming. We were yeah. all swimmers. That's why I wanted so, to take swimming out of yeah. the equation because it's like water is such a. It's like taking away a vital element. Okay. You right. know. Okay. Then running or biking. Now we're just rating our favorites. Yeah. I'll say biking. I would say biking. Um, running. I was thinking about this when we were talking about it earlier, but like running, it, it's closer now. Now the more that I think about it, because it's like running is so easy. You know, like that's just the easiest thing you can do, yeah. like in terms of exercise, like I'm going to step outside and go for a jog like that. Yeah. But when good. you're like 85, are you still going to be going on runs everywhere? Like you could still be biking. I yeah. Know. I don't know. I mean, I'm going with biking because I have found so much joy in like just mm -hmm. finding nice roads and going for rides. And it's like the best thing you can do with, you know, with friends and groups of people and stuff. Um, and there's just so many, so much adventuring you can do with biking. But I, don't, I don't disagree. I will go with running. If I only had to bike or run, I would pick running. I just find it fun and freeing. And it's at instinctual. Your pace, at your own pace, you know, like your twelve minute pace. Yeah. That's like what we're. <laughs> that's like what Not we're reasons. meant to do. Yes. You know, yeah. so it's very primal. And I, yeah, I. It's that's a close one. Running and biking. That was a great question. Um, uh, we got some questions about going pro. Um, you know, we're not thinking about that a whole lot right now. Uh, we've committed ourselves to, you know, racing in the age group field this year. And, um, it's almost a distraction to think about like, well, what's the next step considering we have so many races on the schedule for this year and the goals that we want to hit and the things we want to accomplish at these races can only be done without these kind of distractions and without thinking ahead about like trying to qualify for different things or like what's next, what's, what should I be doing next year? I don't know. Like to perform well at this stuff, you need to limit the noise and you need to kind of channel all the self-talk into positive self self-talk on the task at hand. If I'm going into the race tomorrow thinking about like, well, I need to like beat half, at least half the pros because then I can prove my worthiness to race pros. And, you know, like you can go down a whole rabbit hole about this stuff and um, just not something we are thinking about right now. Yep. If you're not having fun, why are you doing it? Yeah. No. It's very true. Jenna? I haven't qualified for my pro <laughs> <car>. <laughs> Well, there's your answer. <laughs> um. like everybody thinks that I have, but I'm like, 90%. I mean, there's so many different ways in the U.S. to qualify for your pro card. And I don't think I did it all last year. Maybe this year I might, but odds are I will not take it next year. It's just too much fun racing in the age group field. And it's still a challenge for me. Like I won my age group at Oceanside, but I didn't win the race. And I won the aqua bike at multi-sport nationals, but I don't know how yeah, I did done it anything else. Like, <laughs> There's so much competition to be had at this level that I'm like perfectly okay with staying at this level for now. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, the challenges are endless. Yeah. Like I'm not showing up to every race and being like, Oh, I'm going to win this race because I'm an age grouper, you know, like there are very few people in this, in, in the country around the world that can do that, that can just hop into an age group field at a competitive race and be like, I'm going to win. Um, so yeah, lots of challenges to be had and, you know, that's, that's all we're focusing on right now. Yeah. Um, but obviously like there are options out there and it's something that under, in the right circumstances, right time and place, it's cool to think about. And, um, when you're thinking about long-term goals, it's definitely out there. Um, 
but it's out there for everybody. So I don't, that's not really a <laughs> good statement. Um, uh, what do you guys eat before a workout, like an early morning workout? If you're waking up at 4.30 and you have to start your workout by 5.30, like what are you doing? I always have something. I never don't eat before a workout. Even if it's just like half a banana, I like to get something in before I start. Um, I read Roar by Stacey Sims for any like women athletes out there. Like, please read Roar. It's an amazing book. Yes. Um, you will learn a lot about like women in sports and nutrition for like female athletes. And there's just not that much information out there besides what she has put out. And now there's starting to be more and more. And so anyway, she recommends eating something no matter what beforehand. Just Always. Like yeah. Half banana, a little bit of peanut butter, something and some yeah. coffee. Always coffee. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or if like you're running out of time, if you just throw some nutrition in a water bottle that you're going to either sip on like while you work out or like on the way to the workout, um, that's good. But yeah, some calories, some sodium. I used to not eat anything um, because I think like every athlete ever, like we all think about like our body composition in one way or another. So it's like, hey, if I don't eat, like that's a better body composition. That's just not true. Um, you you achieve a good idea. You achieve a good body composition by just eating healthy, like eating the right stuff and, you know, exercising. So we do all of that as triathletes. And if you keep doing that, um, you'll, you'll do what you need to do. The rest will kind of, uh, fall into place. But, um, that being said, I always eat something as well. It just helps me like warm my body up, warm my metabolism up. And it just, it objectively will give you a better chance of having a good workout, especially if the workout is a hard one. Like it's good to eat something. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, are there more eyes in the world or more legs? Eyes. I think eyes. Human animals. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, animals. Animals. Yes. A lot. And in the bugs. <laughs> <laughs> in the bugs. <laughs> the spiders have eight. I think it's mm -hmm. an eight. Ooh, I, think it's eight. I don't know. I say eyes. I say legs. Am I the tiebreaker? Yeah. I think legs. Think about all the ants in the world. There's like a billion, there's like a million ants for a single person. And each ant has six legs. Maybe legs. But but then snakes don't have legs. All the fish in the sea. <laughs> oh, the fish. Oh, <laughs> it's eyes. <laughs> Uh, yes. I don't know. All right, we'll know. Google this after, yeah. but I think we're eyes. Not that we Justin says, Justin Meyer says, got to be, be legs. legs. <laughs> oh, no, all those aquatic creatures. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, we talked about pre workout food, favorite post race food. Like, what are we eating tomorrow? Mex <laughs> Mexican. <laughs> Ice cream and beer. Yeah. Yeah. We're well, that's pre race, right? Yep. Yes. <laughs> pre and post. <laughs> Um, my ideal post-race food is tacos, <sighs> chips, salsa, guacamole, a big margarita, mm. wash it all down, and then ice cream afterwards. Um, yeah, Mexican food and ice cream. Yeah. That's easy. Mm -hmm. And beer. Um, uh, uh, um, back to camp. How long was the camp? And is it uh, for people that don't live in the U.S.? Yeah, anybody can come. Um, camp, we are typically doing Friday, Saturday, Sunday, just like a long weekend for it. And it's open to absolutely anybody. Yeah. Um, Jenna, talk about COVID and your racing tomorrow, obviously. Mm -hmm. And you raced a couple weekends ago. Yeah. Um, how long did you wait? So, yeah, so I got, I tested positive for COVID the Friday after Oceanside. So like the first weekend of April, um, I didn't, I don't think I did any physical activity for at least five to six days, six days after I tested positive. Um, the first four days of that were horrible. I was just super fatigued. Literally anytime I got up from the couch, my heart rate would skyrocket to 120 beats. And I was like, I just 
cannot do anything. So by, I think the Wednesday afterwards, Wednesday or Thursday, I got on the bike for a very easy spin inside. Um, Miguel's mom is my PT and she uh, wrote me a like back to sport training plan. So I really stuck to that and it was like, do 30 minutes, super easy. Do not get your heart rate up on day one. And then second day was like, 45 minutes, do not get your heart rate up and just see what happens. And if I regressed at all, then I would go back to square one, square one. Um, I just took it super conservatively, did not do any hard training until probably another week after that. And then I started picking it up a little more. Um, but I mean, even, even at multi-sport nationals, I was not feeling my best. I waited till Saturday and Sunday to do my races instead of racing earlier in the week just to have like a little bit more time. Um, but probably a week after multi multi sports, like three weeks or four weeks after I tested positive for COVID, I was finally feeling better. And now I'm feeling a hundred percent. Um, I think everybody's COVID experience is different and everybody has different symptoms with it. So just talk to your doctor or like, your physical therapist, your coach about what you should do to like return to sport in a safe way. Cause I know a lot of people just jump back into it too quickly and too soon. And that can like, that can be very, very damaging for you. Um, and yeah, and I was, I felt like I was lucky cause I didn't have like a bad cough or anything. My lungs, lungs felt fine. So if I had had that, it could have been much worse or like a longer experience for me. Um, good segue into this question, but how do I know if I'm overtraining? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's tough because once you start to feel the effects of being overtrained, you are past the line and you, your goal is to not go past the line. Um, so you, there is an amount of trial and error and just being like very, uh, aware of what you're doing and, um, how you're reacting to different training loads and how you're progressing um, and having a coach that is also monitoring this stuff. And, you know, early in my triathlon career, I did overtrain quite a bit and I had to take a step back and scale back and like, okay, like I'm sick for three days. I'm, I was overtrained. Like, what do I do next? And now I've found a point in my training where I take Mondays off always, no matter what, like I will not train on Mondays. And um, I think, you know, depending on who you are and how much you train, like it, I would encourage at least one day off each week and make it a day where you can do things with your friends and family, like go on a hike or something, which is still active. Like you're doing something, but you're doing something that's not related to triathlon. You're giving your body very important. You're giving your body rest and recovery, and you're giving your mind just a break from the grind. Um, so yeah, that like, you'll know when you're overtrained because you'll reach a point where you're hurt or sick or you're just not getting better each week. The goal is you want to be getting better each week. Um, and I like this term on Mondays. I use it to absorb the training because training is one thing, but you actually get better by absorbing the training, by sitting down and doing nothing and let your letting your body make those adaptations that it needs to get better. It's like um, your body is digesting what you have put into it the last <laughs> week. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, the training is a burrito. <laughs> Rest back. and recovery is the cheese. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's... <laughs> I mean, yeah, everyone's different, but you'll know when you're overtrained. But the goal is to just like figure out how to manage yourself so you don't ever reach that point. Mm -hmm. That's my thing. Um, uh, any tips for someone wanting to get into content creation or vlogging? Jenna? Just start. <laughs> I don't know. Get a camera. Don't look at me. Get yeah, a camera. Alex. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Just. I mean, your iPhone works if you have like a camera on the back of it. Um, and yeah, just start putting out stuff. And if what you're making is compelling, it has good storyline and you are somehow connecting with your audience, like 
I'm sure it'll do great. I really have no idea how our channel started to take off. Um, but I think we had some ingredients that like resonated with people. Like we, I don't know. I well, think you yeah. guys are just very relatable um, and you have fun with it. And I think that that's why I'm assuming some people watch. That's why I like you guys, oh, I guess. Thanks. Aww, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Brad. <laughs> um, well, the two things that you, you've said, like it's, you said at the beginning, it's like a joke, but like, just get started, just do it. Yeah. Like you, you do need to reach a point. You can think about it a lot, but like what got us going was like, all right, we're just going to like put some iPhone footage that we had. Like our first video is mostly vertical iPhone footage. And we had a date. We're like, we're going to launch our channel on this date yeah. in yeah. December. Yeah. Um, and it was like, we have no footage. And it's like, okay, <laughs> let's just go through our phones and put something together. But it was like, we just, you know, we, set a date yeah exactly we set a date and we're just like we're just gonna get started um and then the other thing is like do it for no one else but yourself i think that's what you mentioned like oh like you're authentic and relatable and stuff it's because we like sit down and we want to make videos that like we genuinely enjoy and if other people like them that's great but like <laughs> but like i think you will have the most fun doing it and you'll um you know you'll get the most out of it if you just do it for yourself. Um, if your coach doesn't believe in rest days, tell them that you need a rest day. Like your coach is there to serve you and to coach you. And if you as the athlete are telling them that like you need a rest day and they're saying no, then maybe it's not the right fit. Yeah. I mean, the coach, the coach athlete relationship in general, that's huge. You know, you, you should have input in your training plan and um, yeah, it doesn't have to be every week. Some people like spread out, like I train around 20 plus hours a week. And if I, um, you know, and others will train like 10 hours a week. And that's something where maybe, you know, a rest day once every three weeks is right because mm -hmm. there's just like less volume and less intensity. If there's more volume and more intensity, maybe the rest days should come more frequently. I don't know, but yeah, conversations to have with your coach. You should have an input. Can we talk about food a little bit? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Dinner so in, we, yeah. we, okay, we got an Instagram comment from somebody who's a college student who um, wants suggestions on how to eat healthy while training in college, doesn't have much time, is a little budget strapped. Um, I mean, I didn't cook in college. That was really just nice. I was very lucky to be able to access um, our our uh, dining hall, but Costco, cheaper grocery stores, mm -hmm. shopping the sales and meal prepping either yourself or with friends over the weekends, I think are like the big things that I can say would be yeah. helpful. Yeah, if you have roommates and you guys can help share the load of cooking, but then also make leftovers for yourself. Um, I think that's a huge help. I know we would do like massive spaghetti dinners or just like, hey, let's all come over. Everybody brings something like potluck dinners all the time. Um, or just like fun, easy foods. Yeah, there are a lot of resources out there for this stuff too. Like I didn't know anything about this stuff in college. I just like every meal seemed like, oh, I'm spending like two hours with my friends cooking. That was daunting. There are a lot of like healthy, quick options out there. You just like seek out these resources. I, Jenna, Hungry Root has a cookbook, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Hungry Root also. <laughs> you, <laughs> you mentioned it the other yeah. day. Yeah, I don't work for them. <laughs> um, so Hungry Root is one of our sponsors. I also work for the company and like objectively think we're the best grocery delivery slash like easy meal service um, really out there. We have online um, a Hungry Root cookbook that you can access even if you don't subscribe. And basically you can just type in any ingredient that you have in your fridge or any ingredient that you want to eat and out comes like dozens, hundreds of recipes with that ingredient that take no more than 20 to 30 minutes to create. Um, so it's just a really good resource. Sometimes I look at it even, I mean, when we just have like a random bunch of ingredients in our fridge and yeah, it's very helpful. 
Yeah, always have a bunch of random ingredients in your fridge. That's when cooking becomes fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Nick Goldston just oh, asked. We got it. Hi, Nick. Hi, Nick. Um, how much value <laughs> would you put on eating healthy versus eating the right amount of total calories? Oh, I hate this question. Yeah. Would Coach Alex like to go first? Mm. I I like to eat a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have a problem with it, but I choose like, like I, similar to how we would consider like wading in water swimming, um, is how I view my world of salads. You can put anything on a salad and that's like my go-to food for everything. But, um, I don't know. I, I think eating a well-balanced meal and a meal, like a well-balanced diet for a week is the most important, like regardless of just healthy or like just getting your carb intake, like you're going to feel it in your body. Like you're not going to have energy to do your normal things if you're not eating enough. Um, but it's also important to eat foods that make you happy, whether that's ice cream or a salad or a large steak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, um, uh, I mean, it depends where you are, like what your situation is, but like, if you're, you know, in the peak of training and you're putting in a lot of hours, like your body needs fuel. And if it doesn't have fuel, you will not get anything from the training or you'll get sick or you'll get injured. So mm -hmm. like in that situation, like quantity, um, I was reading about the, the, the speed skater, I forget his name. Um, the speed skater who won Olympic gold in the 10 K and mm. the five K. Mm um the long track speed skater and he published his whole training plan online go check it out it's really cool you could probably just google like 10k speed skater um and he details like what he was doing in the off season and how he was training and what he was eating and stuff like that and he was like what did you say he was like taking whipped cream while he was on <laughs> like doing five hour bike rides and he was just like squirting whipped cream in his mouth um, because he just needed the calories. Because and it made him happy, probably. It made him happy, sure. It's like, do what you enjoy. That's the other thing, too. It's like, don't obsess about eating perfectly all the time. If you have a choice between something that is, like, perfect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, your satisfaction from the food that you eat is huge. Yeah. Um, so, like, you know, yeah. take that into consideration, However, too. However, if you're in the middle of, like, training, like, literally, if you're on the bike for hours. Yeah it's absolutely important to get the calories. Like regardless of where they're coming from, you need the calories. Like if you're on your trainer and you can eat a bowl of spaghetti, great. If you are out and you are not going to be feels good to you. <laughs> and it makes you happy. Um, and if you're far away from your car, you can nails. only put like gels in your pocket. That's what you got to do. I mean, someone like is considering a burrito in their arrow bar cage um, for their full Ironman. I, I would not go to, if you had a choice, would not go for the burrito. But you could test it. I, <laughs> I if it works on a you. long ride with sweet potato in my back pocket. Sweet potato is different than yeah, a burrito. That's very true. <laughs> I would do potatoes. <laughs> potatoes is, that's a good yeah, bike tots. food. Those yeah. Delicious. Pocket, pocket tots are a real pocket thing. Tots. Yeah. 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 Pocket tots. Pocket tots. Um, pocket tots. Pocket tots. Uh, uh, what, what else? Um, hung, hunger, root, on time. hunger root does not deliver world. No, it's only in the U S. Um, uh, okay. Do you want to close with, um, because we've gotten a lot of questions about like doing their first 70.3 doing first Ironman or whatever, but, uh, like advice to beginner triathletes, just like what would, what would everyone's advice be? Yeah. My advice, you want me to start? I'll yeah, start, please. Um, find a group if you can, like a local cycling team, like a local swim team, um, or like a run club. And chances are somebody else is doing a triathlon, but find a group that you can start with. Um, it'll keep you motivated. It'll keep you accountable. And it most likely will keep it more fun. Um, my biggest advice is, and I say it all the time, like if you're not having fun, why are you doing it? specific to triathlon, like obviously it doesn't always apply to like work and everything, but you should be having fun doing it. And so if you're having, if you're starting out, um, like just eat up, eat up everything you can eat up the group rides and, and finding community in whatever you can, um, 
even talk to like the race directors itself. If you find a race and you're like, Hey, who are like the big clubs in the area that might show up for it just to kind of get more involved as much as you can. That was going to be mine, yeah. but I will say at my first race, I was extremely intimidated. Like I walked in with my college road bike that was like, <laughs> I don't think I'd ever greased the chain of it. Like it was, it was squeaking its you way. Didn't know what greasing a chain no, was. I didn't know what I was supposed to do, but like everybody had their $10,000 bikes around me. Everybody had tri kits. I was wearing a sports bra and some shorts and I just felt so out of place. And when you're starting the sport, you do not need any of that stuff. You do not need to have the super fancy things. You do not need to like anybody who's there showing up at a race is a triathlete. And like, mm -hmm. like every beginner needs to know that if they're signing up for a race and doing a triathlon, they are a triathlete and they're, they are part of this like amazing community that is there to be supportive and helpful. Like I remember at that race, I didn't know how to rack my bike. And some man with his yeah. giant arrow helmet on and his like, I don't know, his dude tri kick yeah. came up to me. He's like, hey, let me help you, girl. Yeah. And then I, like, he was like, do you have any questions about what's going on? And just like in a very, very nice way, he like helped to guide me to um, just figure out what this whole traveling thing was about. Um, so in a similar vein of like finding people um, in the triathlon world to talk to, to train with, like, just know that like, you do not need all the fancy stuff and you do not need to like look like a triathlete at the beginning to be a triathlete. There is no looking mm -hmm. like a triathlete. It's just getting out there. I completely changed during my first tri try. Like I Good. had like a swimsuit on and I like pulled it down. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I biked with like my swimsuit still on with like a shirt. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was so ridiculous. But yeah. And I think I mean, we can speak for everybody, but we can speak for like, the triathlon community that we know everybody's so helpful so if you have any questions anybody would be happy to help um mm -hmm. a lot of races like we'll call out like first time triathlon like if it's your first race like you get your name called out because it's such a big deal and everybody wants to like just engulf mm -hmm. everybody in our big triathlon hub yeah actually if you go to workingtriathlete.com and you like fill out the little coaching form or whatever and tell them that you found out about them through our YouTube channel, you get a free consultation. Like it doesn't mean you have to do any type of coaching or put out any type, any money at all. You can just have a conversation with one of the coaches um, mm -hmm. for free. So mm -hmm. like do that. Yeah. <laughs> That's huge. I think combining what both of you said is like, there is no right way to do this sport. And I want to specifically talk about what Ironman has done in this sport is like make Ironman full distance, the pinnacle of the sport. And that is super intimidating to a lot of people. It, it's an awesome way for some people to like, you know, train for a bucket list item, but like, please know that is not everything in this sport. Please know that the expensive bikes are not everything in this sport. Like there are, wherever you are, there are awesome local races to sign up for. And the community is just as good, if not better, at those little races than the big Ironman mm -hmm. races. Um, and they're a lot cheaper. So, like, you know, I think, yeah, there's no right way to do this. If you really enjoy running, but you're kind of worried about the other two disciplines, like go find the running club because that's what you're most confident in and start there. Mm -hmm. You know, like just go wherever this journey takes you and never feel like intimidated or pressured to do it a certain way. Um, it's a lot more fun that way. Yeah. That's kind of why we call ourselves freestyle try. That's part of the reason because it's, it shouldn't be a specific way, you know, you should have a dose of freestyle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. Is that it? Yeah. It's should dinner we go time. eat dinner? Yeah. It's time to eat. We've talked All about right. food enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, follow us tomorrow. We're doing Ironman 70.3 Chattanooga. Um, yep. Alex Leandri. Jenna Hoffler, we go Maddox. And thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I don't even know how many people watch this, but if you're like just joining us at the end, please rewind to the beginning and watch whatever we talked about at the beginning. I really <laughs> yeah, don't go remember. find the burrito content. Um, <laughs> it's there. <laughs> and if you have any questions, like always DM us on Instagram um, at Freestyle Try or Jenna Hoffler, Miguel Maddox, and A. M. Leandri. Yes. Oh, nice. I'll tag you a few times. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so.
Cool. Um, and yeah, I hope everybody gets after it this weekend, whatever you have going on, and eat your big day oats. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> signing <laughs> off. Eat your big day oats. Bye. Bye. <laughs>